Hello, everyone. Hope you're all doing okay. Hope you're well. There are a few archaeological sites that have really captured the public's imagination, like Gobekli Tepe. And uh, today, I have the pleasure of talking to Jens Nartroff, an archaeologist who uh, has worked on the site, continues to work on the site. I've got a ton of questions for him. I'm probably going to be picking his brain for far too long. He's going to get sick of me, but uh, I really think you're going to enjoy what he has to say. So uh, thank you, Jens, for joining me on my channel today. Yeah, thank you for inviting me, actually. Yeah, no problem. I've been meaning to make a video on Gobekli Tepe for so long, because as I as I told you just before we started, it doesn't matter what video I talk about, what subject I talk about in my videos, you know, 11th century China, someone's going to hop in the comments and say, yeah, but what about Gobekli Tepe? Why, are you, why aren't you talking about that? Why are you keeping that from us? <laughs> I bet. Yeah, so I'm really happy to uh, have a, a real expert here. I hope you don't mind me calling you that. Oh, wow. Well, and uh, <laughs> I think, in my opinion, you are a, definitely such a strong word. Yeah, I, I, you, I used to work on the side, but uh, that's okay. You know far more than me, that's for sure. So, for my viewers who have been living under a rock, I don't know how you <laughs> could have possibly missed this if you have uh, been following archaeology, but. Uh, what is Gobekli Tepe, briefly? Oh, briefly. Okay, I'm going well. to... <laughs> I, I'm, I'm trying to, to, to cut it short. Um, actually, it's a um, very early monumental site. It's a site of the earliest or one of the earliest yet known uh, monumental constructions. It's a so-called pre-pottery Neolithic site, so it's uh, dating to, to the early Neolithic, right after the last Ice Age. Name pre-pottery uh, already implies it belongs to a time when people were still hunter-gatherers, highly mobile and not even having invented um, pottery by then. Well, it's a, it's a rather large site. It consists of a lot of mon monuments. Maybe we can discuss about this later. Basically erected by hunter-gatherers and for the purpose... Um, that's our current working uh, interpretation, uh, so to say, for the purpose to create a meeting place, a gathering place where different groups, different mobile hunter groups of the region come together to exchange goods, to exchange uh, information, uh, marriage partners. And uh, apparently uh, this site was marked by these monuments and um, yeah, a lot of social activity was going on there, like um, yeah, communal building projects, the monuments itself, um, maybe feasting rituals. So um, yeah, that would be really in a nutshell the the basic information uh, about Gobekli Tepe. Oh, maybe I just have to add, uh, pre pottery Neolithic might be a bit special of a term. We're talking about the tenth and ninth millennium BC here. Yeah, and it has these a uh, huge. T-shaped pillars, which are which are really famous, exactly. probably the most this, famous this, feature of it. Yeah, this is the main characteristic architectural feature. Of these, um, yeah, really characteristic T-shaped pillars, like the letter T, the capital letter T. Yeah. Now, I I have to ask this because I know someone is already typing it in the <laughs> comments. You said it was built after the last ice age. So is it built after yeah. the younger Dryas? Um, well, we're 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 talking <laughs> we're talking about the the, the period there. Um, the, the climate is changing there. Uh, of of course, related to this change, um, um, <clears throat> nature and culture are changing. And archaeology is it, it's difficult to pinpoint a specific date in archaeology. We're talking about time frames here. So these are processes which are not happening all of a sudden, but these are developments over, over a certain amount of time. So we're uh, right in the middle of uh, this younger Dryas uh, uh, change happening, so to say. So this is um, right after the Ice Age, the climate is changing, and this brings a lot of, uh, lot of uh, yeah, change with, with it in the environment. Um, and this, of course, affects the, the way how people uh, back then lived. Yeah, I think that's important to note like you said, that these changes happen over a long period of time. Yeah, we sort of yeah. dig it up and it looks like a, a snapshot, but these are very long processes. But we'll definitely uh, cover more of that. I just have to ask, as 
an archaeologist. You know, did you f- feel very lucky working on such a, a famous and popular site? I would. I think I would lie if I say no. Um, of course, it's uh, yeah. it's fascinating. Well, not about the f- the, the the fame uh, of of the site itself, but the the implications the the site and our excavations there have actually make it so so exciting because um, this is maybe one of the at the moment very rare places where we can put a finger. Uh, onto a very crucial point in the history of ourselves. So this this is the the period and and the wider region where our modern lifestyles actually yeah started. If you if you want to put it like this, this is where people started to um, become uh, sedentary, create permanent settlements, starting with agriculture, husbandry, and so on. So pretty much everything which defines our our lives today yeah so 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 in short yeah it it is pretty exciting to work there <laughs> yeah it must be yeah it's such a, a key moment in history there aren't many uh i remember when i did my archaeology degree we tried to find the first metalworking site in britain which you know would have oh. been fantastic to find yeah and uh we didn't find anything we spent weeks digging around in the hills Found absolutely nothing and came home. Yeah, but so. that's that's also uh, and we, we yeah we, we cannot deny this. That's also an important part of archaeology. Sometimes you're just looking and there's not what you're expecting to find. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. I've had plenty of those before. So, oh yeah, me too. Yeah. So you touched uh, briefly on that as um, Gebekli Tepe as this sort of meeting place where people in the in the wider community would gather was anyone living at Gebekli Tepe was it a purely this meeting place or was it a, a settlement in any way or are we not sure about that well, the last one we're not really sure about that um because it's not completely excavated so if i would say there is no trace of a settlement um and i don't know the complete extension of the site um, I, I could not know if there would be different kinds of architecture in, in other spots. But what we do know is how settlement domestic architecture of that period and region looks like. And apparently we did not really find uh, structures matching these these uh, building types. And Gebekli Tepe, we have to, to imagine as a it's on a mountaintop in a mountain ridge and usually settlements are uh, preferred to to be created in uh, yeah much more favorable positions uh, in the valleys where the animals come by where water sources flow and so on these are things we do not really exactly have up there on the mountaintop at Gebekli Tepe so it would be quite some way down to the valleys um, and we're not quite sure about um, water sources uh, on top of the mountain. There is a rather shallow, very little river uh, in, in the neighborhood right uh, these days, but it's not quite sure if this well, was existed in, in the Neolithic as well and if it was sufficient to uh, provide enough water to establish a settlement up there. So um, I would be careful. I wouldn't really exclude that people were staying for a longer time there. But as of yet, it's hard to prove in the archaeological record. Um, I mean, we have to keep in mind if these were uh, highly mobile groups and these hunter groups were, were mobile, they probably were living in tents or something like that um, during their stay on, uh, on the site. And of course, archaeologically, tents wouldn't leave much of a trace. So it's, it's more on the not sure side. Yeah, yeah. But as you said, not the most ideal place for a large village no that's and, for sure and really the, the villages we know they look different what's interesting about the villages we know and which are excavated to a certain degree that um, almost each of these settlements has a building which is set apart from the rest of the um, typical domestic architecture it's uh, larger it has benches and uh, often uh, specific um, uh, stone furnishings with sculptures and so on. And this is interesting because these so-called special purpose buildings or communal buildings 
um, resemble what we do have on Göbekli Tepe as well. With the difference that in the villages there's one or two of these buildings and at Göbekli Tepe there's uh, much, much larger numbers of these communal buildings. So this may also give a hint uh, about the relationship between villages and the this gathering site or social hub um, uh, at Göbekli Tepe. Wow, that's interesting. I definitely want to pick your brains about the villages. So Gebekli Tepe is this uh, famous site with the T-shaped pillars. But as you said, other we have other villages around the area. Now, am I right in thinking that some of these also had those T-shaped pillars? Yes, yeah, that's true. Um, the most uh, famous or best known example probably is um, the site of Nivali Chori which uh, was excavated in the 80s nearby. And uh, this was actually the site where these T-shaped pillars were discovered for the first time. And there they do have the case of such a, a settlement with a special purpose building. And this building, this communal building, um, yeah, produced these T-shaped pillars. Nebulichori is a bit younger than the um, oldest phases we recognize at uh, Göbekli Tepe. And uh, there maybe as a short excursus in, in uh, Neolithic architecture, there's a general idea that um, the building shape went from more circular or oval buildings to rectangular ones. And at Gebekli Tepe, we can, um, can see this as well, that the much larger monumental and apparently older um, enclosures buildings are the large circular ones with T-shaped pillars of 4 meters to 5.5 meters in height. And then there's a younger layer or younger buildings, um, which are rectangular, um, producing much fewer and much smaller T-pillars uh, than these older, uh, larger enclosures. And now the pillars are about two meters high. And at Nevelichori, we have this later phase as well with the rectangular buildings and smaller T-shaped pillars. So the scale of the monument sort of, dec well, at least in the size of those pillars, it decreased over time. Yeah, yeah. The buildings and the pillars um, got smaller. Yeah, that's true. Interesting. Are any of the villages that we've discovered so far contemporary with the earliest levels of Gebekli Tepe in the, in the large monuments? Or Yeah, it's a bit difficult since we're still discussing site chronology and um, really only have hints at the exact chronological setup of the enclosures. I mean... We have already carbon dates from uh, some of the wall plasters uh, in, in these buildings. But of course, these dates only tell us when this wall was plastered for the last time. Um, we do not really know when the um, enclosures were built. Of course, in archaeology, you have certain, certain tools and techniques at hand to uh, get an idea about, about the age. So in this case, it's uh, basically tool typology. The stone tools are very specific and we can, can compare these to other known sites. And this is how we arrived at this pre-pottery Neolithic uh, age, uh, plus, of course, the complete or almost complete absence of pottery. And those, it's difficult to, to really say um, there's this and that village is of exactly the same phase. But, of course, there are famous uh, sites like, for example, Chayunu, which uh, definitely can be uh, set into the same time frame as, as Göbekli Tepe. And at Chayuni as well, we've got one of these special purpose buildings, for example. And are these pillars in these special purpose buildings, or are those pillars separate from them? I'm just trying to uh, well, picture in, it. In, 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 yeah, yeah. In, in, in Chayuni, which is in the Tigris region, um, there are no real T-pillars, but this might be... Um, where we, if you got a map of um, special architecture, we see a certain certain regional um, uh, yeah, regional development. So there are these T-shaped pillars in the Euphrates region around Göbekli Tepe, Nevelichuri and so on. And then uh, the further we go, for example, to the Tigris, like uh, with sites with uh, uh, Chayunu, um, where the T-shaped pillars are more, at least in the preserved state, we, we now know them from excavation, are more um, yeah, uh, upright stones, autostats, without necessarily the, the T bulk on, uh, on the top. But uh, these sites are linked by iconography and tools and so on, so that we really uh, understand they belong to a wider cultural community. Uh, but to answer your question, at uh, Nevalichuri, the T pillars are inside the, the buildings. 
Mm, interesting. So it is. So they are, in a way, very similar to uh, buildings at Gebekli Tepe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, they're definitely comparable. Yeah? Even those sites without the explicit T shapes are comparable by uh, interior design, by the typical benches, and so yeah, it's 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 safe to say that there is a connection between these sites in the in the wider region uh, of that period. Yes, I, there's one thing. I, I'd, I'd really like you to help me make clear in my mind because I feel like with uh, Gobekli Tepe we have this it's very difficult to talk about it in the archaeological terms that we have or at least in my mind I find it very difficult mm -hmm. because these people building these villages and Gobekli Tepe on the one hand we're using the phrase uh, pre-pottery Neolithic and sort of the, the mm -hmm. very early start of settled agriculture and on the one hand, we don't have the evidence that they were farmers as such. I, I've, I've been trying to read up before this interview and uh, the sort of grains that we find are the wild varieties rather than domesticated. Yeah, yeah. And we, uh, I don't believe they have any domesticated animals there. Is that correct? Um, as of yet, the, the uh, record hints uh, at um, the wild species yeah but it's difficult actually um, um if i may already join in or do you want to to extend no, no, the question? i was just wondering because i feel the people <clears throat> when we say hunter gatherer we sort of imagine yeah. people that live like uh, maybe kalahari bushmen and on the on the other hand they're building these huge monuments mm. how much what sort of lifestyle do you think these people were living were they raising crops from wild varieties how how settled were they do we have an idea of that well they definitely were staying uh, um, at a place over a longer period of time but at the same uh, time they were seasonal and so far that they were following the animals um, we know that the gazelle herds are coming through the area in spring um, and so this would be the time where um, huge gazelle hunts probably were organized but they also were regularly retreating to these villages we know of. The thing about um, agriculture and husbandry as a as a yeah as an event of food production is that this is something we really cannot easily see in the archaeological record. It's easy for me to say, of course, with um, with the help of our uh, specialists from from zoology, that certain bones belong to wild species, but in fact. Domestication is a long process which takes quite some time, generations, uh, for animals at least, um, to become visible in, in the physical record. So until a bone or, or the appearance of, a, of an animal changes, uh, there's a lot of time going, uh, going by. And that's why as far um, as uh, if I sum up the discussions we have with our colleagues from archaeology is, that in the beginning, of course, animals, wild animals are managed and the whole domestication process um, starts over time and takes a long time. And the same is true for, for plants as well, of course. So um, the lifestyle uh, of these hunter-gatherers and the huge amount of animals, animal bones we found at the site, which basically are hinting at gazelle and aurochs, um, certainly underline that hunting was uh, a huge factor in, in subsistence. So I definitely would stick to the term hunter-gatherers. But they may have had aspects of their life that were more in common with later Neolithic farmers. Yeah, I mean, at, at one point, um, they must have experimented with, um, with plants uh, coming back if, if you put them in a certain place. And I can imagine that this is, is, is happening uh, occasionally uh, as well. So there's no reason to, to assume they wouldn't experiment with other food resources. But um, the final step to, um, towards food production was not yet done. I think we're, that, that's the interesting part of the site. We're right in the middle of this process. Yeah, so definitely. I think, I mean, and I did a lot of research on the origins of the Neolithic for One uh, video of mine. <clears throat> mm -hmm. And the sort of length of time it probably took for what we can see in the archaeological record as as agriculture to develop was was really thousands of years, and Gobekli Tepe seems to be sort of smack bang in the middle of that time frame. Yeah, that, that, that's the point. It just doesn't 
pop up and, and is there that we're talking about the long process here. And we're currently looking at one step in this long process, but an important step in which that makes the site so exciting. Yeah. Yeah, because if you, are, I'm just imagining, you know, if you are a hunter gatherer and you lead a more mobile lifestyle, you can't just wake up one day and be like, okay, from this day onwards, I am a farmer. Exactly, that, that's not how it works. Yeah. Whilst we're on the subject of the villages, still, we have Gebekli Tepe, this huge site where people would gather, and we have uh, villages around that in the the region of sort of southern turkey we ha we haven't defined that for people sorry we're talking here in sort of southeast uh, turkey yeah uh how does this area and this culture compare to other areas in the fertile crescent i know for example further south in the levant there are many sort of uh, pre pottery neolithic sites and very early sites that show sort of experiments with agriculture is gebekli tepe very different to them or does it fit into this whole regional pattern of the neolithic well it's it fits in how uh, in so far that um, we can of course see this um, this drive of innovation and experimentation there as well it's uh, a bit different um, due to its position in the northern periphery of this so-called fertile crescent um, which in the past uh, looking from the southern levantine side was always considered periphery due to um, yeah state of research, I would say. But now it turns out that this northern rim of the Fertile Crescent gains at least as much important as the southern sites. And there are also a couple of elements linking um, these regions, I would say. I mean, we have this uh, really fascinating pre-pottery Neolithic uh, funerary uh, ritual, if you well, would like to call it like that, which seems to express... Uh, a real fascination and concern with uh, bodily disarticulation, with excarnation, so with the defleshment uh, of uh, of bones. We know from sites like Jericho, Tel Sultan, for example, these famous plastered, replastered skulls where um, mm, I've seen those. Yeah, yeah, yeah defleshed skulls were given back a new face with with gypsum and uh, and all kind of shells as uh, a inlays. And apparently in the northern part of the Fertile Crescent, we have hints at a similar fascination with um, this kind of mortuary ritual. We, uh, in, the, in the iconography of Göbekli Tepe, for example, we see a lot of depictions of uh, headless human beings or separated human heads, often in combination with uh, uh, scavenging animals, in particular vultures. Um, vultures in general play an important role in the iconography um, of the site and related sites. And at sites like Chatal Hüyük, for example, uh, which is a bit later uh, in Göbekli Tepe, but still belonging to that Neolithic realm uh, of the area. And there are also examples of uh, replastered skulls. So um, this is something I think um, which links the area. So there's uh, the broader PPN culture, uh, if you want to put it like this, yeah. That's fascinating. I didn't realize how widespread that uh, the plastering of skulls was and the fascination with that. I really, yeah, I, I saw a few examples, but in my head, I, I had assumed that they were just from a, a couple of sites. I didn't realize how, m m most how popular an activity are, that was. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I know on one of the, the pieces of architecture at Gebekli Tepe, there is a large carving of a bird. Is that interpreted as a vulture? Do we believe that to be a vulture? Um, if you're referring to to one of the pillar decorated pillars in pillar 43, I think there's definitely there's a large bird depicted, uh, a lot of other birds and a headless human being in the lower part. Yeah, that is uh, actually with the help of our colleagues from archaeology, it is interpreted as as a vulture due to the characteristic beak and there is a very present color on uh, on this bird and this. This is a feature very common with uh, the vultures, actually. To me, it looks like an albatross. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, well, looking at the uh, at the animals actually around at the site, and the in particular in the bone material, vulture makes more sense than albatross, actually. <laughs> I know. I really regret saying that now because I know someone's going <laughs> to jump in and be like, "You're right. It's an albatross, Atlantis." <laughs> yeah. Oh. Or in dodo, dodo or something, yeah. Oh, really? I haven't heard people say that before. Were 
were people buried at Gebekli Tepe? That's, a, that's an interesting question. Um, since we, one of our, our ideas about the site is that it is related to this mortuary ritual I was, um, was uh, referring to just, uh, just a couple of minutes ago. We didn't find any burials yet, but, and that's a big but, in other sites, I mentioned uh, Chayuni, for example, the burials were placed inside the walls of the special purpose buildings. And as of yet, we didn't, didn't uh, look into the walls. We didn't deconstruct walls at the site for uh, simple uh, stability re regions, uh, reasons and uh, documentation reasons. Um, we know of a couple of human bones coming from the backfilling material uh, in these buildings, um, which is a bit problematic um, because they are small in number, sm really small compared to the animal bones. And we really still do not know where the material actually is coming from, which is accumulated in, uh, in these buildings used to at least partly backfill them. So um, it could be older stuff collected elsewhere near the site. It could be a, a bit younger stuff pulled in there after some time of, of use. So this is quite difficult. But the human bones we did find in this filling material are quite interesting. They are part of uh, skulls, uh, a couple of other uh, human bones, but the skull, the skull pieces um, show some interesting cut marks and uh, scratch marks. And our uh, anthropologist colleagues uh, were interpreting these um, these marks as um, yeah, kind of ritual um, modification of of the the skulls. Interesting, but no no burials as of yet. Which yeah, there, there could be a reason for this as well. I mean, I'm carefully speculating here but with the uh, concern about excarnation defleshing and this omnipresence of vultures and other necrophagous animals in the iconography um, there are other very famous examples from Chatelhuk for example of depictions of vultures and headless bodies next to these vultures and the idea came up that maybe part of the funerary ritual was what we would call sky burials uh, with a view to um, yeah, even historic or even modern burial practices in, in Asia, in Tibet, for example, where dead bodies are uh, exposed to animals in rather remote areas. And in particular, it's vultures when feeding on the flesh and when the defleshed bones are collected and buried. And interestingly, the... the um, Bodies have to be prepared because uh, the vultures just cannot pick the, the flesh. So um, the, the bodies are prepared with, uh, with the help of, of uh, tools like knives and so on to um, help the vultures to, to pick the flesh. And I could imagine that this preparation would also leave some kind of cut marks and so on uh, on the bones. And if we imagine Gerbekli Tepe as a possible site of such a sky burial ritual, when it would make sense that we do not have the burials there since if it was only the site for defleshing and the bodies were buried elsewhere, it would somehow fit uh, into the picture in particular since we know that in the Neolithic burials often were, were um, undertaken under the floors of the living rooms uh, in the settlements. Mm. So if there were burials, they might be under the, the floors of these buildings which we haven't been able to deconstruct in the floors and walls well but... yeah, not not in this case uh, maybe in case of the younger a bit higher buildings but the uh the floors of these larger circular buildings uh, monumental buildings uh, consist of the natural bedrock so they are erected on the carved mm. and smoothed uh, uh bedrock so um, i don't expect any burials underneath there that would be quite quite some effort to cut <laughs> into the into the back bedrock sorry i could imagine that that the bodies were then brought elsewhere to be buried there. And another point um, I just remember, maybe working as an argument here as well, I mentioned the animal bones uh, and also vulture bones. And among the uh, the avifauna, the bird bones uh, we unearthed at the site, there's a really high degree uh, coming from necrophagous uh, birds like vultures, and in particular corvids, uh, ravens and so on. And this, in my opinion, may be also um, yeah, another hint at some something very uh, something going on there, which was rather attractive for these kinds of birds. 
that's really changed how I uh, how I picture Gebekli Tepe in a way. I know we're very carefully speculating here and just sort of discussing what might be. This isn't a, a definitive answer, yeah, it's but in my head, tossing I'm... around t- tossing around ideas, and that's how we arrive at interpretations in the end. Yeah, but in my head, I imagine Gebekli Tepe. You know. I've always sort of viewed it very positively, like the dawn of civilization and like man making this incredible sculpture, but it could have you know, been covered in dead bodies being picked around by vultures. Uh, uh, one doesn't have to exclude the other, I think. Um, it, that's also something we encounter quite often um, when we discuss not only Gerbekli Tepe in, in particular, but ritual uh, in, in, in prehistory in general, this, this distinction between ritual spaces and domestic spaces and and this this clear distinction between these these theories which are of course a result of our secular western uh, upbringing but uh, actually i don't think that that there is a necessary distinction between these for for other people uh, as well so it could belong together so yeah i, I wouldn't say it's mutually exclu- exclusive that's a that's an important point to bring up we definitely have a clear divide between ritual and secular activities in a way that these yeah. people may not have had at all. You did mention uh, that Gebekli Tepe was back filled, was filled in. So we have this big site that has, you know, been a huge effort to construct over many, many generations. Can you give us an idea of how long it was used for before it was filled in? Uh, it's it's really difficult to give exact time frames here, but we're certainly uh, talking about generations here. Yeah, uh, the the backfilling, ev- yeah, the backfilling event, and it's well, it it sounds easier than it actually is. Um, this site stratigraphy is actually quite complicated. So what we can say now, but this is still something uh, we're working on actually, is that at least in the lower levels of the sites there are some clear hints at uh, intentional backfilling where depositions left and so on and the material speaks in favor of uh, yeah intentional backfilling events but we also have to to say that in in the upper parts a lot of the material just looks like it may have also eroded in like um if for example a building higher up on the mound was crumbling and walls were falling down. This material was rushing down into the enclosures as well. So we have to consider both actually uh, intentional backfilling events, but still leaving part of the building visible and in particular sticking the heads of the T pillars out of the out of the uh, filling. And then the complete closure of the site, the complete backfilling events might well be also associated with natural events, erosion events, and so on. Mm, that's interesting. I've never, and nothing I've uh, read about it so far, the perhaps unintentional backfilling. So that's, that's, it's still work in progress. So our picture is still changing, of course, with ongoing uh, ongoing work. We have to keep in mind, um, excavations at Göbekli de Tepe just started in 1995. So we are comparably a rather young excavation and still far from reaching reaching the end of all all work there i'm sure this will take years and years and years to uh to excavate the full site completely well, there's enough work left yeah, yeah well, i'm sure of that. it's not it's not really the intention to excavate uh sites completely uh, uh now in archaeology just for preservation reasons because of, of course excavation uh, means destruction of of the context which are so interesting and actually even the more more important part of of the excavation than the mere fine material itself because it's the context telling us uh, about when and what uh, happened there and how all these finds the objects were associated so that's why usually we aim to excavate as much as necessary to answer particular research questions but at the same time still leave a lot of the material a lot of the context preserved in in the ground for colleagues with probably, uh, surely, better developed uh, techniques and approaches uh, in the coming years. Yeah, that's an important thing to say because I know there are many people out there who feel like, let's just dig it up. Let's just get the answer right now. Let's just dig up the whole site and uh, and see what we find. But like you say, once we remove it from the context, we remove all that context, yeah. 
we exactly. like lost the ability to learn from it. And that's that's also why it takes so painstakingly long to to document everything. Yeah. Does Gebekli Tepe in any way affect our view of the the origins of Neolithic and the origins of farming? Because I know there's sort of the Am I right in thinking there's a divide between people that think that archaeology developed very slowly, almost without sort of deliberate human action? And then they're not sort of mutually exclusive, but then other archaeologists that believe uh, these large gatherings and preparing for feasts kind of in- encouraged agricultural development. Does Gebekli Tepe yeah. affect our view of that in, at all? I know it's um, often depicted in the uh, in, in popular popular uh, depictions as a kind of a game changer, but in fact, research in the in the area and in the Neolithic process, the process of Neolithization, um, is uh, going on in, uh, in particular in, in Anatolia for for a lot of years, even before um, excavations at Gebekli Tepe started and. Actually, excavations at Gobekli Tepe are a result of this preceding research. So um, it definitely helped us to get a finer picture, to get a clearer picture of the events uh, surrounding this so-called Neolithization process. But it's not uh, turning our uh, our ideas about the Neol- Neolithic period upside down. You mentioned these, these feastings and that maybe the necessity to have enough surplus to to attract uh, the crowd for for this feasting and communal work processes may have um, somehow fueled the the interest uh, to experiment with uh, other food resources and to start um, to start food production and i think that definitely should be a factor we we should keep in mind here uh, one of the earliest sites where einkorn, this is one of the uh, Neolithic founder crops, um, was cultivated and domesticated, is uh, the the shield volcano of Karacha Da, which is in the wider vicinity of Göbekli Tepe, and w- with genetic pinpointing, it could be could be uh, established that this is one of the sites there there this um, domestication started. And I think this is related to the events we see at, at Göbekli Tepe, yeah. Were they using these grains? This is a very important question. Were they using these grains to produce beer? <laughs> that's actually that's actually a question which is as old as uh, archaeologists uh, thinking about uh, domestication of, of, of grain. I think it started in the 1950s with the so-called Breadwood Symposium, where the question indeed was discussed if our interest in the domestication of, of cereals was uh, initially for making bread or for producing beer. And from a rather pragmatic point of view, it's actually easier to produce beer than to produce uh, something like bread. You have to prepare the, the grain, you have to um, uh, do much more work steps to finally end up with a, a loaf of bread than to just um, yeah pull put some some uh, uh, grains into water add uh, the necessary yeast which could as well come from the bacteria we have on our our skin as well and then under certain conditions and certain temperatures which is a bit complicated more complicated when I when I put it you know it could ferment and develop a very light beerish kind of uh, of a beverage. And we have at Gerberti Tepe, we do have large stone vessels with a capacity of up to 160 liters, if I'm not mistaken. And well, in these vessels, we found something which might be uh, interpreted as the results of uh, fermentation processes. Yeah. But <laughs> it's if we're imagining a nice pint of beer, we should probably get that image out of our head. It, like you said, it would be yeah. very light and not what we're thinking. Yeah, yeah, colleagues, colleagues did some uh, experimental archaeology in recreating the kind of uh, beer which was, which could have been brewed there. And uh, to put it politely, uh, it's nothing I would like to drink every evening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think so. Yeah, probably had a lot of bits in it. I feel like not a smooth. Yeah. <laughs> Not yeah, and, and, and not that much alcohol, but in the end, it uh, was uh, it had had its advantages towards water, which 
which in particular, if we would store it for a couple of days or weeks, it was much, much better than just uh, having the, the water there. I had never thought when I was reading about that debate that beer was that easier to produce than bread. It's air. Yeah, I mean, uh, if, you, if you just think about all the work steps uh, from, a, from cereal, a grain to a final bread, it's uh, quite some in-between work steps which uh, have to be done producing flour and so on. Now, I have to ask you this question because I'm aware the clock is ticking and, and we can't skip it. <laughs> okay. There are many people out there, Jens, who would say <laughs> that you are a bit of a shill, you're hiding the <laughs> truth, and that Gobekli Tepe is evidence of an advanced civilization, one that maybe even spanned the globe before the younger Dryas. <laughs> And um, and that you're just not imaginative enough to see that. And it's not possible for gatherings of hunters to produce such large architecture. I mean, I don't even know <laughs> what the question is, really. What do you make of these accusations? <laughs> well, and why don't we believe that? Why don't we believe that Gobekli Tepe is this basically the survivors of Atlantis, to put it bluntly? Yeah. I mean, it's not the only example of, uh, of uh, still rather mobile groups creating monuments. We know no other examples as well, if I imagine Poetry Point, for example. Um, it's an impressive example for sure. Um, but, well, advanced technology is, is one of these words um, I, I really don't know what to, to make of. Uh, what is advanced technology or an advanced society uh, in this context? We know how these pillars how these buildings were created we we know the quarries we know the tools so it's it's rather for us it's it's really not that difficult to see the people carving these pillars moving these pillars and directing these pillars to the places where we, we find them now and the tools are typologically comparable to other sites and they clearly say pre-pottery neolithic hunter-gatherers <laughs> Um, to, to, to be honest, I would have difficulties to imagine how this advanced civilization, globe-spanning civilization, would have looked like. If you're talking about a large-scale civilization, then we again have the problem that these people must have, must have eaten something. And again, we don't have any genetic record of, uh, of domestication processes prior than Neolithic, uh, so-called Neolithic revolution, Neolithic package. So. Um, it just doesn't fit. So if there was an advanced civilization, we surely would have found more of them than these rather singular sites uh, and apparently uh, apparently not even uh, globally related sites uh, uh, in the world. So that's, that would be my take on, uh, on, uh, on, this on these accusations. Plus, personally, I don't have any advantage of denying the existence of such an exciting super civilization. Quite the opposite. If I knew of, of a globe-spanning ancient Atlantis-like civilization, don't you think I, I would score a Netflix deal and book deal and everything to to just come come up with uh, come out with these things? That's always the the part that I find most funny is that the accusation that archaeologists are hiding the truth because they're so concerned about preserving their ideas and preserving their positions. But if anyone is going to benefit financially from the discovery of Atlantis, yeah. it's all the archaeologists who will just immediately start churning out books and documentaries. Yeah. And in particular, so, archaeology, if I may add, is one of the few disciplines I'm aware of constantly changing uh, uh, paradigms. Uh, so it's... If you just look at Neolithic research the last 20 or 50 years, we have changed our ideas and theories so often, it, it's, it would be quite hard to say we're sticking to old ideas here. Yeah, I, yeah, it's, it's definitely true. I mean, I've seen some videos on YouTube that say, you know, they'll start off with the phrase, archaeologists think civilization began in Mesopotamia 2000 BC. And... Uh, you know, I don't know anyone who who would. I don't know an archaeologist who would say such a thing. To be honest, yeah, like, uh, it, at it, all. It, 
in particular, we even abandoned uh, terms like civilization because these are hollow terms and everybody can project uh, imaginations into, into this term as we want. Civilization is, is a concept which is not really reflected in an in, in archaeological record or the archaeology, archaeological theory, actually. Yeah, like you said, it's a hollow term. I always imagine it. I yeah. don't know if this is a good example, but I always imagine it sort of after the fall of the Roman Empire in Britain, you know, we had abandoned cities and all yeah. sorts and society sort of took a, a step back for a bit. And yet we still had uh, writing, for example. And over yeah, on the yeah. other side of the world in Mesoamerica, maybe they didn't have writing, but they were living in huge urban centers that we wouldn't match for hundreds and hundreds of years. So exactly. which one was the civilization? You know, what does it even mean? It's, yeah, yeah, that's really always in, in the eye of the one who make, comes up with the definition. And this, it, it, it's not really helpful. Could you speak super briefly about the quarries? You mentioned we have the yeah. quarries and the stone tools. Is, is yeah, there, yeah. Am I right in thinking there's a, one of the T-shaped pillars that was never fully dug out exactly. of the ground? Uh, more than one, actually, but there's one very prominent because it's rather large, about seven meters, I think. And the quarries are situated on the rock plateaus right around the site. So it's, uh, it's, maybe this is also one of the reasons the monuments were erected where they are, because the, the material, the resources were already there. Um, and we, we know the quarries, we, uh, we map them. And it's really visible where workpieces were retrieved. And um, you can see the, uh, we called it atelier situations. There are tools lying around. There are um, uh, remains of, of these work processes, so rubble and so on, lying around. And as you said, there's even one very prominent large T-shaped pillar still lying around uh, at, at some point in the process of cutting it from the limestone benches uh, it uh, apparently was breaking and then abandoned for that reason because it couldn't use, couldn't be used anymore as a workpiece. So yeah, but it's all in the really closest vicinity to the site. So very short, short ways actually. Uh, it didn't have to carry them far, and the yeah. and they could have perfectly easily cut the stone out of the rock using the tools that they had available to them. Yeah, the the limestone is rather soft and could be easily scratched with the uh, material lying around, like the the flint stones, for example. And the limestone uh, appears here in the geologically. It's quite interesting. Appears in benches, so I basically only had to work out these benches and cut the, the natural limestone layers uh, uh, out that would make would have made it much easier than to carve the whole pillar uh, uh, um, even in, in its thickness uh, out of the bedrock as far as i'm concerned that's case closed <laughs> sorry atlantis <laughs> maybe next time yeah maybe next time. i know there's one video made by a very prominent uh channel on youtube that just churns out in my opinion pure bollocks and uh, it says that the proof of Gobekli Tepe is that is part of an evidence of globe spanning civilization is that they had a bag, an alleged bag carved on one of the pillars. And also yeah, in uh, I know this handbag scenario, but actually, if you if you go down into each of these depictions, uh, they're not at all uh, related. I mean, we know the the Mesopotamian examples, which are buckets, and we even know them from written sources. Uh, the things on Göbekli Tepe actually, uh, the handle of this bag is uh, is so awkwardly put on that it wouldn't work as a bag, and you have little animals depicted next to each of these these uh, depictions. Um, so it it really looks more like a depiction of the maybe the buildings itself. So that's why the half circular shapes appear. But uh, I wouldn't think uh, a Stone Age hunter has a lot of uh, need for a handbag actually that's interesting that they might be depictions of the building because when i was looking at it's, that, it's just theory, an idea yeah just an idea but as you said the sort of handle is sort of off to one side it wouldn't it be in the middle of the back so i i wondered that yeah um but it, i mean i th the bag is one of the most basic constructions ever every human ever has been able to work out how to make a bag it's not if evidence you, if 
that they were if you want to carry something the easiest way is to put a string or something on it and uh, hook it up that would be the easiest way to construct a mode of transportation yeah. Uh, yeah. maybe the idea why if, why i think it might be depictions of the uh, enclosures in this case of the buildings is the little and the little animals next to it because where there seems to be one very prominent animal associated with each of these buildings so which is appearing rather often in the depictions of the pillars and maybe if this is linked to to certain group identities it would make sense to depict a building next to the emblematic animal but again this is just an idea and um, more more tossing around uh, thoughts than actual uh, factual proof yeah what animal is that it depends on the on the building there's one building oh, okay. uh, showing a lot of birds another building showing uh, dominated by depictions of of boar um so it really depends and it changes with with each building interesting almost like they had a had a theme maybe yeah before we go i have a, a few more sort of quick fire questions from my patreon okay. supporters yeah. if that's okay yeah, and, yeah sure uh, yeah th- Thank you very much to Patreon guys for supporting me and making this stuff possible. I appreciate it. Codaholic wants to know what is the the biggest surprise that you have found there, or the the thing that surprised you the most about Gebekli Tepe. Um, that would be probably the implications of these buildings for social hierarchy among uh, hunter gatherers in the Neolithic. So the the idea that so many people were working together. And somebody had to coordinate all of this. And this implies social hierarchy. Um, at least I wouldn't have expected um, uh, among these, these groups. Mm. At least tempo, temporary social hierarchy. Yeah, someone would have to at least temporarily have to direct yeah, yeah. people and have the just, plan of how they were going to make yeah. that building. You, you just can't bring 500 people together and expect that they're coming up with something like this without coordination. Yeah, that's true. That's a very good point. Um, Merrick would like to know, does the attention of the people that believe that Gebekli Tepe is basically the survivors of Atlantis, does that ever interfere with the work and the research on site? No, not really. It, well, maybe it, it changed how we address this public, public uh, interest and the narrators that we spend a bit more time or at least recognize the importance of uh, public outreach more to um, make visible that there are more interpretations than these rather rather uh, exotic uh, uh, interpretations in the, in the which are dominating in the public idea about the site yeah exotic and shallow i would like to add that don't <laughs> yeah. look at the full picture of the site at all storm of steel shout out to that guy he has another youtube channel himself check it out mm-hmm. Um, he wants to know what is the uh, strangest question you've ever been asked about Gebekli Tepe. Strangest question? Oh, um, I, I'm, I wasn't asked this directly in person, but it comes up very, very often, and you you discuss it here as well. That the site may have been uh, uh, proof of an advanced super civilization, in particular of an alien super civilization, but. That is high up on the list of strangest things, I would say. Yeah, that, I mean, never even mind. I mean, Atlantis is one thing, but never even mind the aliens, guys. That's really, that's really far out there. I always feel like those uh, ideas, you know, they're so critical of the evidence that archaeologists present. And then when you ask for the evidence of aliens, it's the most superficial, non-existent. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's it's ever. it's kind of a lazy, uh, lazy interpretation because it, it yeah delegates all the work to an imaginary group, and so yeah, it could have been everything. Uh, Krishna, my patron, wonders how is research funded at Gebekli Tepe because there is this accusation that groups fund research to get a specific result that they want i know this is kind of a, an expensive question but that's well, that's a good question actually i mean the the research project is a cooperation project of the german archaeological institute and the uh, archaeological museum in in, in Ofer in turkey so it's an international and interdisciplinary cooperation 
and the money is coming uh, partly uh, uh, from from the institute, uh, of course. But basically, we are funded by the German Research Foundation. We are twelve-year project, and the rest, basic uh, the the German Research Foundation, of course, is uh, is uh, yeah funded by German tax money. So we are basically funded by by taxes. And when that money is handed out, there's no expectation of you must find this certain result or anything like that. <laughs> no, there's a strict rule, uh, not only in Germany, but I would say internationally, that uh, uh, science uh, is free. So there's this idea of scientific freedom, and this is explicitly also said about the funding processes. So no, we definitely don't have a list of things to check off we have to find. Okay, uh, last question. Keegan wonders... Um, They've seen, I'm not sure which image they're talking about personally, but they're saying that they have seen uh, an image of a woman at the site that is perhaps not carved in the same style. Is this perhaps like a, an, early, an example of graffiti? I'm, I'm not sure which carving they're referring to. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I know what they're referring to. There is indeed um, the whole iconography of the site as far as it's... Uh, readable by by the clear mode of depiction is dominated by male depiction so we have a lot of phalluses around uh, animals and people are indicated as male uh, examples and there's indeed one female depiction and which is a uh, this is a later graffito on a stone slab in one of these rectangular buildings i was mentioning and it yeah it's a, a carved uh, crudely carved um, figure of uh, of a woman we are addressing it as graffito indeed yeah because it's so interesting it's so so unique in the whole iconography interesting i'm now imagining <laughs> one you know woman back in the day thinking like screw all these phalluses <laughs> everywhere i'm gonna carve <laughs> myself under one of these pillars and it's not on it's it's not on one of the pillars it's a stone slab uh just a, a block of stone lying in one of the buildings maybe not even part of the original building oh okay but by but it it still was in the context of this being done in the neolithic not not yeah, yeah, later yeah. than that not like in the middle probably i mean it's uh it's hard to date uh stone carvings but from context uh, it belongs to the neolithic i would say to the to the Neolithic uh, period, yeah. Is there anything you really want the public to know about Gebekli Tepe? Anything you feel like doesn't get any uh, attention? Uh, no, not not in particular. Just um, question what you read on the internet, and if you got access to the original resources and sources, uh, dare to look them up and read for yourself. Make your own mind and. Don't believe everything which is written on the internet. Don't even believe everything I say. Just check your sources and have fun learning more about the past, which is really exciting even without advanced super civilization and ancient aliens. Promised. Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, they can go to the Tepe Telegrams, correct, to uh, see what you, your, you and your colleagues are reading and writing about the site. Yes, exactly. A lot of the stuff I was mentioning, like the cultic community and all the other sites with similar iconography and similar characteristics, like the animal bones, um, all of this stuff you, you can read on the, on the blog in much, much more detail. The colleagues uh, are doing great work um, collecting and presenting the work and making it, making it accessible um, even beyond the scientific publications. So yeah, definitely check it out. Excellent. There you go. No conspiracy out there, guys. <laughs> We're making it Definitely as easy not. as possible. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Jens. I'll put thank the you. Tepe telegrams and your Twitter down in the description. Check it out. Stay informed, guys. Read the sources, follow the sources. And uh, yeah, thank you so much, Jens. This has really been uh, great. I've absolutely loved it. It's been my pleasure. Thanks a lot.